Good morning and welcome. My name is Dan Mish. I am a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center and an alum of the Chicago Council's Emerging Leaders Program. Thank you for joining us for this morning's program, China Goes Green. Today's program is part of our China's Changing Landscape series, generously sponsored by the Dr. Scholl Foundation. Before we start the conversation, please note that the Council is an independent and nonpartisan membership organization. We are on the record and views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions of the council. I'm sorry, institutional positions or views of the council. Today we will discuss China's new green authoritarianism over the next 45 minutes. After remarks from our guest speakers and a short moderated discussion, we will incorporate your questions. So please turn to your browsers at ccga.live to submit a question or vote for questions you like. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Yifei Li is an assistant professor of environmental studies at New York University, Shanghai. And Judith Shapiro is director of natural resources and sustainable development at the American University. Yifei and Judith's new book, China Goes Green, Coercive Environmentalism for a Troubled Planet is available for sale at the bookseller. And you can find a link to purchase the book on the event website. Welcome Yifei and Judith. Thank you so much, Dan. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, Judy and I want to share with everybody here today um, our new book that's, um, as Dan introduced, China Goes Green, Coercive Environmentalism for a Troubled Planet. Um, and here's the cover of the book. We wanted to uh, begin the presentation by telling you a little bit about ourselves. Um, Judy, there you go. Judy, I think you're on mute. Thanks everybody in the council for inviting us. Um, and thank you in Chicago for getting up so early to have coffee with us this morning. Um, yeah, so this picture uh, I think will establish the fact that I have been involved with China for a very long time. I hope you can recognize that it's still me. Um, so I was first in China in 77 and I first lived there in 79. And so my whole life has been involved with China and this, most recent project that I did together with Ife is um, really, it's been the most delightful of all the projects I've ever done, I have to say. Thanks to Ife um, and um, my ability to work really nicely together. So that's me as a young person adopting to China. And uh, on this slide, you can see that's me. I was born and raised in the city of Shanghai. The picture on the right-hand side of this um, slide is actually my childhood home, which stands on intersection of East Nanjing Road and Hunan Road in uh, downtown Shanghai, right there at the very center of the city. Um, establishing the fact that uh, I, I live under um, China's authoritarian um, rule, I understand a lot of um, the problems from firsthand experience growing up, but also from my own research studying um, bureaucrats and bureaucratic decision making in China. We wanted to begin um, today's presentation by uh, telling you a little bit about the uh, main reasons why we came together to write this book. We have been reading a lot uh, in the English language literature where authors seem to express an awful lot of admiration for the kind of decisive moves in China on the part of the Chinese state to pursue environmental goals. This notion of ecological civilization seems to be used again and again by Chinese state officials and foreign observers are looking at China citing examples such as the Chinese renewable energy promotion policies or the plastic ban or various other, other kinds of environmental initiatives as proof of how ecological civilization seems to have produced good environmental outcomes, which leads many observers who already are frustrated by uh, the inability of democracies to come up with effective solutions to our environmental challenges to begin to entertain the possibility that maybe authoritarian environmentalism is the way to go. We very much want to empirically evaluate the extent to which that speculation uh, can withstand an empirical scrutiny. Um, but Judy, you might want to talk about uh, some of the other impetuses for writing. Yeah, the other impetus um, for the book is our sense that, um, in, in, especially in recent years, the Chinese state has been using environmental justifications to further some of the goals that it's had anyway to um, 
increase control over citizen monitoring to so-called, uh, here's a, this is our table of contents. So to increase um, control over citizens to so-called pacify the borders by forcing nomadic people to move into settlements um, in, all in the name of um, environmental preservation of grasslands. And so what we did was we, um, this is a very quick overview of the book, we um, focused on the industrialized East, the less developed West, of China going out on the Belt and Road, and even China um, in outer space, um, changing the weather on the Tibetan Plateau and sending up certain kinds of um, environmental monitoring satellites to mine the far side of the moon. So um, we're gonna give you some tastes of each of these. There's not time to go into all of them. Um, so the first tool we're gonna to talk about is the tool of using campaigns and crackdowns and setting targets, which are very quantitative. So one of the styles that we noticed throughout the book is this notion of um, trying to achieve a goal in a short time. So here's an example of um, APEC blue or parade blue or G20 blue. Oftentimes the Chinese state will say, we need to have a blue sky because it's gonna be the Olympics. And so they'll shut down everything for a period of a week to make the sky blue. This is just a decoration, but it serves to remind us how short lived sometimes these campaigns can be. Another campaign we documented is actually right here in the city of Shanghai, where I am physically located right now. The city introduced a, a rather strict new recycling mandate last summer. Um, and this recycling mandate forced citizens to actually dispose of their garbage within a two hour window in the morning and a two hour window in the afternoon. If you miss these four hours, if you come, come home too late, you simply will not be able to legally dispose of your garbage. And as you can see on the image on the left-hand side, people adopt what um, scholars call weapons of the weak by responding to these draconian interventions into how citizens conduct their everyday lives just by throwing away their garbage right next to the garbage collection center in the neighborhood. And at the same time, this new recycling mandate aims to formalize a lot of recycling activities into the state controlled uh, mechanisms for waste disposal to such an extent that this mandate has pushed a lot of the mom and pop uh, informal recyclers, as you can see on the right hand side image, who have been doing recycling in the city for a decade or even two decades, perhaps much longer, um, it, the new mandate has effectively pushed them um, out of the city, making their employment uh, either untenable or um, uh, straight out illegal. So we can see that this kind of quantitative approach um, sometimes really captures small vulnerable people in its net. This is just a taste of the kinds of targets that these poor local officials have to meet. And um, I'll just give you one more example of how these targets can hurt innocent people. Um, a couple summers ago in Hunan province, there was a target to um, reduce air pollution by a certain percentage within a certain amount of time. And it turned out that the, when the farmers used their threshing machines, that created artificially high spikes in pollution readings. And so the local officials banned the use of threshing machines. And as a result, the farmers lost the entire season worth of grain. Can you imagine what a nightmare it is to be um, a local official and uh, receive these quantitative targets? So moving towards the West, we have also examples from what we call one size fits all policies, also green grabbing and so-called ecological migration. I think um, Ife is gonna talk about tree planting for one size fits all policies. Indeed, uh, one of the examples that we looked into was the rehabilitation of the Los Plateau in, in central China. One of the reasons why the initial rehab rehabilitation efforts were extremely successful was because the state opened itself up to scientists, ecologists, sociologists, economists, um, and all sorts of experts to spend two years of their time studying the local livelihoods and even oral histories of uh, various kinds of communities who have depended on the local landscape as a um, source of income and uh, basic ecological conditions for their lives. 
Um, so that group came together through a two-year fact-finding mission, put together a rehabilitation plan that worked so well because it made economic sense. It gave the local communities a, a sustained source of income, but also it made ecological as well as social senses. And yet that rehabilitation effort went awry further on when the, the government chose to highlight only one part of the plan, which was planting trees. And they didn't understand why you needed to plant multiple species of trees to form a complex local ecosystem. And they, in the end, pursued poplar trees. And these poplar trees turned out to be extremely damaging to the ecosystem because these trees have very deep root systems that sucked up a lot of underground water from the aquifer um, and, in the end, intensified desertification. Um, so this is one of the examples in which we see an initial effort on the part of the state um, to, to open up to citizen inputs, to non-state inputs that led to success, but when they pursued one-size-fits-all policies by shutting themselves uh, away from uh, non-state inputs, these um, well-intended projects can easily go awry. But Judy have other examples that she wanted to share. Yeah, okay, so this is a slide to talk about ecological migration, which um, sounds lovely. Uh, ecological migration sounds as if we've all woken up and we're not rebuilding on the coast because of the hurricanes, because of sea level rise, but that's not what it is at all. Ecological migration is the forcible sedentarization of nomads by the state in the name of grasslands protection or creating new national parks um, this is, you know, um, there's a famous uh, anthropologist named James Scott, who has pointed out in his really famous book, Seeing Like a State, that states hate nomads. And this is a worldwide phenomenon, you know, it's a marsh Arabs and gypsies and so on and so forth. Well, the Chinese state has been trying to make the nomadic people of Western China become legible in Scott's words, settle down, be civilized. And so they give these poor people you know, um, what they consider to be a better living condition and a little money. And meanwhile, they're essentially forcing these people to give up their very cultural identity, which rests on being nomadic people. And just another, one more quick example. I know we're running out of time already. Um, this is an example of green grabbing, where um, there's a big spate of big dam building in southwest China and also across the border along the Mekong in Cambodia, Vietnam, um, not so much Vietnam, Laos, um, Thailand. And a lot of times when you justify the building of these big dams in terms of international commitments towards lower carbon, it becomes that much harder for local people to resist. And so we're that's starting to be called green grabbing in, in, in a little bit of alignment with another concept of land grabbing. Yeah. So moving um, out along the Belt and Road Initiative um, with win-win green development framing, you can see that the um, propaganda is that it's all a joyful experience. Here we see happy Africans and happy Chinese um, holding the fruits of the earth in their, in their in their happy little hands. Um, but as we know, increasingly, the Belt and Road has been meeting with um, some skepticism and even some countries have canceled Belt and Road um, contracts or sought to renegotiate. This was the original conception of the Belt and Road, just an overland route and a sea route, but now it's everything you can think of. There's a polar Belt and Road and an outer space Belt and Road, and there's a dairy Belt and Road that goes between New Zealand and China on milk products. So it's pretty much all of China's um, external activities, and I think Ife is going to comment a little bit on um, the authoritarian Im impacts of this. Oh, okay, here's another different slide. So just to think in general, this is my slide, in general about the global impacts of uh, the environmental impacts of China's rise, we can think in terms of um, um, traditional Chinese medicine and the impacts on bi global biodiversity. This, these these species have always been um, ingredients in traditional Chinese medicine, but now the middle class can afford to buy it. And also the Chinese presence overseas is that much greater. So the pressure, particularly on elephants, tigers, sharks, rhinos, pangolins, these poor pangolins, um, 
you know, it, it's become really acute. And the Wuhan coronavirus, this is an old slide, now we call it COVID-19, comes out of the consumption of wildlife in these wet markets. And then we also have this kind of second stage of, or latter stage of capitalism, if you will, where China has risen and now running out of raw materials at home, looking overseas to extract minerals, fossil fuels, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, to think about the, how the Belt and Road Initiative is focused on big infrastructure projects, these deep water ports, big dams, pipelines, these roads, high-speed railroads, power plants. In fact, these fragment landscapes and they transform habitats and they have a deep effect on biodiversity and livelihood. So, um, you know, that's why I always argue with my own students who are studying environmental issues, China may be just one among many countries, but its, it's footprint is so big and its rise has been so rapid that it deserves a special attention. And we all have to try to understand the impact of the rise of China on the global environment. Yes, absolutely. And uh, as, as the listener, the audience would rem remember, we've covered a number of different scales. We began with the industrial east of China. We then moved to the western borderlands, uh, then to the Belt and Road. And now we wanted to take uh, your attention to the global commons and China's impact um, on the well-being, the ecological well-being of the global commons. One of the things we wanted to stress about this book is that this book isn't just about projects that went awry or various kinds of environmental failures that uh, has to do with the Chinese state. In many of the cases, we also highlight success. The reasons why we wanna study both success stories and failures is that we want to be able to systematically compare them in order to understand what exactly are the mechanisms that produced these successes and also the mechanisms that led projects um, to go down in a way that is perhaps less than desirable. One of the examples that we wanted to focus on uh, in terms of a success is China's waste import ban that came into effect um, last year. One of the reasons why uh, this ban became uh, such, uh, had such a huge impact on the global waste trade was because it, it, it wasn't framed in and of itself as a ban, it was framed as a restriction, but because it was so restrictive, it effectively resulted in a situation where uh, other countries could no longer sell their waste, their solid waste to China anymore. Why is that significant? Since 1990 till about uh, 2019, about 45% of global plastic has ended up in China in some form of shipments into the country. So when China decided that it wasn't going to take any of that waste anymore, it meant that 45% of global waste has nowhere else to go. Um, it, it was impactful, but at the same time, we need to understand that it was not implemented overnight. The Chinese state, in fact, has been ramping up its import controls for solid waste for well over 20 years. And in that period of time, the Chinese state worked very closely with the domestic recycling sector to slowly upgrade the amount of recycling that they can do, to slowly upgrade the kind of materials that they can process. And at the same time, they spent a lot of time trying to work with filmmakers or um, international NGOs on cases like what you see on this slide, uh, the Guiyu e-waste recycling center. They work with filmmakers to understand how the local um, uh, households, the migrant workers in various kinds of mom and pop recycling facilities facilities throughout rural China are actually handling e-waste and what exactly are the environmental harm of doing that. Through these two decades of, of a very long period of time of working with various kinds of communities within and without China, the state was able to improve its waste control mechanism in such a way that uh, when the ban came into effect about a year ago, it in fact produced a lot of incentive for domestic recyclers to continue to improve. And also internationally, it resulted in various other countries like Vietnam and Malaysia to follow suit in declaring that they weren't going to take any foreign garbage. Um, and in turn, countries like New Zealand or American states like California began to adopt uh, initiatives that encouraged their own citizens to reuse 
rather than recycle. So we felt that this um, initiative really turned out to be hugely successful in a number of ways. Yeah, so one more really interesting example of uh, China's um, willingness to use technocratic um, methods to try to achieve environmental goals. Um, <laughs> um, the Chinese state is really worried about um, climate change. And I know that's a really hot topic. We can talk about it more in the Q&A if you want. Um, so the state knows that the melting glaciers are causing floods in the short term and in the longer term, they're causing droughts and falling aquifers. So they've actually started to um, install machines that shoot silver iodide into the clouds to make it rain. And this is the same thing we saw earlier with that APEC blue uh, sky short term kind of thing. But this is an all the time kind of thing where satellites are monitoring when the monsoons are coming up from India. And then ultimately tens of thousands of these machines will be shooting these chemicals into the air to make it rain to change the weather on the Tibetan plateau. Now we have no idea what the implications of this are. We have no idea whether this is gonna take somehow moisture away from India. We have no idea how toxic those silver iodide pellets are, um, but it just gives you a sense of the ambition of the Chinese state to basically um, invent their way out of the environmental problem rather than deal with the root causes. So um, we have just two final thoughts. Um, and I'll start with this one. We started out thinking about um, the state's efforts to achieve environmental goals through authoritarian means, but we ended up feeling more and more as if the state was using environmental justifications to achieve authoritarian means. So this is a little wordplay, but I think it's a um, very significant part of our findings and our argument. Another aspect of our argument um, in the way of a conclusion is that um, it, it's somewhat of a counterintuitive argument is that the strength of China's brand of state-led environmentalism hinges not on the strong state, but rather on mechanisms that place state power in check. In the various kinds of failures, if you will, for lack of a better word, that we've documented, we see that the Chinese state acted decisively, but these decisive moves were not premised on broad-based inputs from various kinds of groups within society. And, and that lack of inputs from society led the Chinese state to pursue initiatives that did not benefit um, it, it, its own citizens in various kinds of, of ethnic groups. Whereas when the Chinese state is willing to open up to various state inputs, journalists, scientists, independent document filmmakers, and all sorts of groups, it is capable of delivering the same kind of decisiveness um, but that decisiveness, when premised on a foundation of popular support, in fact, can generate results that are both environmentally beneficial, but also social and economically um, sustainable in the long run. That's uh, all we have in terms of an opening presentation. So thank you once again, everybody for joining and thank you to the Chicago Council for giving us this opportunity. We look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Yifei. Thank you, Judith. I have a couple of my own questions just to get the conversation started. We do have audience members submitting their questions at ccga.live, which we will get to shortly. Um, my first question is that with China dominating the solar panel industry and on track to do the same for batteries, one could argue that the U.S. is losing an economic advantage in clean energy. But the partnership between U.S. innovation and China commercialization can lead to rapid deployment of new technologies that we're going to need to fight climate change. So is this a partnership that we should pursue in solving the climate crisis, or should we be more cautious given China's author authoritarian environmentalism? Hmm. There's a lot of commentaries right now because both um, Biden and Xi Jinping have declared ambitions to be carbon neutral, uh, Biden by 2050 and um, Xi Jinping by 2060. So some people have said, well, this is because the relationship is so terrible right now, it's likely that it'll be kind of more of a competition 
rather than a cooperation. Now, call me naive, but I've dedicated my personal life to um, trying to understand China on a people to people kind of level. And um, there's a theory in environmental politics, which is the theory of environmental peacemaking. So I, that argues that sometimes states that are, don't see eye to eye on all kinds of issues can sometimes come together on environmental issues and find new ways of cooperating. That can be a wedge issue. And so I'd like to believe that this would be at least one area in which Biden and Xi Jinping can start to talk again, much of the way Obama and Xi Jinping came together at the APEC summit in 2014. Um, and that would be a great starting point for um, revisiting what's really going on in the US-China relations, which you know Donald Trump did so much unnecessary damage to. Mm -hmm. Yifei, anything to add? No, yeah, I just want to say that, you know, if collaboration means that the two countries and top scientists in these two countries are going to come together and figure out better solutions faster, then I'm all for it. Or if competition means that scientists are going to develop the best technologies that they can in order to get an edge um, in, in, in that, right? and again, I think is great if, if we can foster the kind of competition that is going to give us a shot at, at tackling the environmental challenges um, that we have, and, and they are many. Um, I, I'd say either competition or cooperation. I, I don't think I, I have a strong um, inclination either way, um, but, but the really big question is for everybody to begin to acknowledge that um, the climate challenges and environmental challenges in general are, are really, really serious. I think the, the, the Trump presidency has done so much damage to the existing international environmental apparatus, and, and we, we simply don't have too much time left um, to reverse um, the conditions of, of the earth. So Judith, you mentioned the 2014 talks, and I'm curious to know, um, since that differs so strongly from what we saw out of China back in 2009, Copenhagen talks, what led to the sudden shift um, from 2009 to 2014? Yeah, that's such a fun question, because in 2009 in Copenhagen, China was considered to be the party that spoiled the talks. Um, so lots of analysts have written about this actually. And it seems that when Obama came in, he was able, despite the lack of Senate control um, by the Democrats, he was able to make some unilateral moves to stop, for example, to stop um, building new coal-fired power plants, just using his executive power to make certain kinds of commitments, which then allowed China to say, yes, the US is stepping up and therefore we are willing to do so. Because before then, the Chinese very naturally said, look, you put all that carbon in the atmosphere, you underwent your industrial revolution, you got rich on this, then you displace your environmental harm onto us, and now we're choking to death on your pollution, so that's not fair. So both sides were saying, that's not fair, that's not fair. So Obama was able very graciously, I think, to take some initial steps, and that allowed China also to take steps. And in that same period, we also need to recognize that environmental protection figures increasingly centrally on the agenda for Chinese top decision makers, not only because environmental uh, pollution, for example, is getting so bad in China that it's becoming a real issue in terms of the Chinese Communist Party's political legitimacy, but at the same time, I think with notions like ecological civilization, China is increasingly showing a, an ambitious side of its political leadership in wanting to become a new global leader in delivering ecological sustainability. So when they say that they want to pursue ecological ecological um, civilization. They're projecting domestically that they are building a renewed kind of civilization for a country that has a very, very long history. And that renewed kind of civilization is unique in its orientation because it's uniquely ecological. It's something on, a, on, on the scale of a nation that has never been attempted before. So I think China has found in this notion of ecological civilization a, a niche area, if you will, in competing with other countries. So, so, so definitely, like Judy said, in the US, in the US side, um, the Obama administration was able to make a lot of strides that, that were quite unprecedented, but also in China, uh, the political wings changed in favor of environmental peacemaking. 
And Yifei, on that ecological civilization, what was the timeline for that? How far back does this go or how recent is it? Um, it, this notion came uh, forward uh, in the previous administration in China under the Hu Jintao administration. I think it was originally proposed in either 2007 or 2008. Uh, I'll have to read my own book to, to find the exact year. Um, but it was Xi Jinping, once he took power, he really tried to give a whole new spin to this term, not only by enshrining it in the Chinese constitution, in the Chinese uh, Communist Party's charter document, but also by just keep repeating it at all of the major um, documents that he was overseeing and all of the major meetings that determined essentially the strategic positions of the country. Um, so in a lot of ways, it, it became uh, Xi Jinping's signature policy statement, even though he didn't technically invent the term. And if you want to ask an ordinary Chinese person, what is ecological civilization? They don't probably know, but they just know it has something to do with the greatness of China, you know? So it has this nationalistic flavor. There's a reason they chose to, to form a new phrase rather than simply using something like sustainable development, which would have been a Western import. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to turn to the audience questions and, and one related to what we're talking about now. Have you had feedback from the government on your book and its findings? Not yet. Okay. Um, another question here. What are the biggest obstacles facing China in their attempts to reach carbon neutrality by 2060? Mm. What a great question. Uh, well, I guess I'm trying to think how to best address that question. Um, well, in terms of achieving carbon neutrality, what we do know is that um, there has been a number of uh, local level experiments to try and see if they can achieve carbon neutrality at, let's say, a sporting event somewhere, let's say, in the city of Beijing. There are existing rules in Beijing that govern um, sporting events on the note of carbon neutrality, what they've been asking these event organizers to do is that they everybody has, uh, has to do what they call a carbon inventory. So you calculate the amount of energy that's required to heat up or cool down, the, cool down the stadium, the amount of fuel that's needed to transport people to and from the stadium, um, or uh, the amount of water that's used and so on and so forth. So you do a really, really detailed kind of accounting um, to determine the total amount of carbon that's associated with the event. And then you compare that total number with what the government has allocated to this particular event in terms of a, an allowable carbon emission credit. If your number exceeds your quota, you have to actually go to the Beijing carbon cap and trade mechanism to buy up more carbon credits in order to have that event um, be approved by the government authorities. Now, that has been a, a rather common approach for local uh, authorities to determine um, carbon neutrality or even to make a claim of something achieving carbon neutrality. But one of the things I think Judy and I both worry is that such a mechanism essentially gives Chinese state actors sweeping power in determining what kind of economic activities are more worth the while for them to give more carbon credit to. Or if you have um, an event that happens to not align so well with what the Chinese government sees as being worthwhile, then perhaps they can punish you by giving you less uh, carbon credit to work with. Um, and, and one of the things we do have to remember is we as humans, carbon is a fact of life um, on this planet. Everything we do will have a carbon footprint. So when, when a state actor has so much um, discretion in determining carbon footprints, it, it could potentially lead into a lot of political interventions in private lives. And if I can add up two more concerns, um, one is that as we mentioned earlier, this may fuel even more building of big dams, um, which is just seismically risky and you know, has tremendous impact on um, human rights. 
Um, and um, also for that matter, nuclear power, um, which counts as a renewable in some people's book. I don't know how the Chinese are gonna count that. And then finally, we have to look at the, um, what we call the shadow ecology of the country. In other words, China is exporting a lot of its carbon-based activities. It's exporting coal-fired power plant technologies. It's building and financing coal-fired power plants all around the Belt and, Belt and Road. So if you really look at what, what, the, what the carbon footprint looks like, it may be something quite different. Now, this is a problem for all different countries. I mean, look at wonderful green Norway, who gets all of its um, wealth from exporting oil, right? But that doesn't count against Norway's carbon footprint. So um, it's not just China, but we have to look at all of this. So for us, you know, yes, China might achieve carbon neutrality by 2060, but let's see how is it implemented? What are the costs of doing that? And, you know, is it really sustainable in the long run? And does it build a better society as well as a better planet? So I have a few questions here about the U.S.-China relationship, and you've already talked a little bit about um, the current administration's impact on the relationship and the potential for the incoming administration. Um, the questions are, to what extent has the trade war with the US or the pandemic slowed China's progress in its war on pollution? And in what ways can the US or other Western countries influence Chinese environmental policies? Hmm. Um, well, we do see, for example, in during, during post-COVID recovery, um, one of the centerpieces of the recovery package was to exempt what China considers to be pillar industries of the Chinese economy to exempt actors in these pillar sectors from environmental assessments, uh, environmental impact assessments and uh, environmental standard compliance regulations. Um, that um, also in the way that these uh, uh, recovery packages was worded was that um, during the period of about six months, these companies simply don't have to comply with environmental regulations at all, or that they can voluntarily choose to comply, but nobody will be checking on them at all. Um, it, it's, it's still unclear if this is just a short-term impact or if it's something that after the end of the six month period that they will continue to extend or that they will choose to pause at that time. It, it, it is unclear at this point. Judith, anything to add? Uh, what was the second question again? <laughs> oh, can the US or Western countries influence China's uh, environment policies? Yeah, I, it, on the people to people level is a very dynamic um, relationship. And um, we've had, you know, personally, at least five Chinese students come through our graduate programs, go back to China and take leading roles as lawyers, as heads of NGOs, as commentators, blog writers. Um, so on the people to people level and then on the institution to institutional lo level as well. Now the space for environmental activism has shrunk under Xi Jinping. It's much harder for foreign environmental NGOs to um, register, um, to carry out their activities. Um, to partner and help fund domestic Chinese ENGOs. But at the same time, this is not over. It's not as if they've all been banned or kicked out. I mean, it's harder sometimes to operate as a foreign NGO in India than it is um, to operate as a foreign NGO in China. Um, so, um, and then on the scholarly level, you know, I, I, I guess what breaks my heart the most about what Trump has done is he's cast a kind of cloud of suspicion over international students, over foreign scholars, over he's made it that much harder for our students to go to China to study if they want to. And so this is, I think the, the root of the cooperation has to be, has to rest on the people. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, um, you know, there's states like California that have their own climate cooperation programs with China and that has never stopped even under Trump. So I think we have a lot to build on and um, some, some damage to be undone, but I actually do believe that the Chinese will um, be ready to work again with us on these kinds of issues. Yeah, and I just want to answer that question by stressing one of our conclusions, which is that the success of Chinese environmentalism depends on various kinds of non-state inputs. So it's not just activists, not just um, students and NGOs, but also filmmakers, scientists. Like Judy said, um, all of these channels, they just have so much potential in cross-fertilizing 
um, various kinds of studies in different parts of the world. And, and we need all the knowledge that we can get in order to come up with better solutions. Um, and it's just, you know, we've been trying to, for example, at NYU, we've been trying to host various kinds of film festivals in New York, and then we bring them out to Shanghai with the goal of bringing some American filmmakers to China and to collaborate with Chinese filmmakers on some of the most pressing issues of our, of our time. And these kinds of connections are just so important um, because it's only through these kind of cross-cultural dialogues that people come to better understand what could be a possible solution, what could be a way to better influence the policymaking process, what could um, be something that they could even devote their careers to. And you know, Judy and I both work with a lot of students uh, in our day job and, and, and working with students and seeing our students um, grow and, and ultimately going into um, careers that can have an impact, those have been uh, some of the most rewarding experiences. This next question is on a specific topic. Do you ever see China reversing its hydro policy, specifically those that restrict river flow to the neighbors such as Vietnam? Um, well, we, Judy and I were, were both part of a panel on that particular issue two weeks ago. Um, at, at least at this point, uh, I, I guess, unfortunately, the answer is, is no, or at least not that we can see. Um, in America, uh, public opinion about the threat of China as a world power has been relatively stable. Around 40% of people see it as a threat. Uh, for the past 10 to 15 years. Uh, Pew Research showed China's impact on the global environment was the number one problem area in 2020, outranking cyber attacks, job loss, trade deficits, and military competition, all the things that we hear about environmental was number one. Uh, what role do you think that green authoritarianism has had or could have on international opinion about China's environmental report card? Well, we hope our book will contribute to a more no nuanced view. Um, I just saw yesterday, you know, yet another conference on ecological civilization, and isn't it wonderful? <laughs> you know, international, I think it's being held in Costa Rica. And so I, I do think that the, the world tends to be a little bit misled by how pretty this sounds. Um, but, you know, we go forward with our eyes wide open. You know, our book is a kind of it's a warning, but it also gives praise where praise is due. One thing that I love that happened after the book was finished, is China banned those little plastic bottles that, that you can get in hotels, you know, those shampoo bottles. You know, that's a great thing. Please, Donald Trump, ban those little shampoo bottles. Use your dictatorial power to do that if you can. You know, that's great. So we want the state to be decisive when it makes sense for it to be decisive. We don't so much want it to be decisive when it's got these other agendas going on that have nothing to do with the environment. It's not as if Xi Jinping woke up one day and decided to hug a tree, you know? <laughs> it's not about that at all. It's about um, continuing the power of the Communist Party of China, intensifying that power, making sure that the environmental issues are dealt with enough such that the rising middle class that is so afraid of its cancer and its food safety and all of this, that they will make an agreement to allow the CCP to remain in power. And at the same time to deal with climate change issues, which are kind of an environmental security threat that maybe the state understands even better than your ordinary Chinese person does. And, and just one quick thing to add um, is I, I think it's unfair to uh, describe China as the only villain um, in these stories of, of Dan in the question that you just um, asked. Um, China indeed is a major player in many of these undertakings, whether it's on the Belt and Road or even elsewhere in the world. But China alone, the Chinese state alone, wouldn't have been capable of doing so much if it weren't for the fact that there, there is a hungry global market for the kind of Chinese technologies, 
for the kind of uh, technocratic controls. I mean, I, 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 we were Judy and I were just talking um, to someone who who actually was was bringing in a Moroccan perspective, suggesting that in Morocco there is a huge desire on on the part of the leadership, a huge desire to get access to Chinese technologies, to get access to Chinese uh, renewable energy uh, railways and trains and, and highways and, high, and coal-fired power plants. And, and Morocco is not alone. I think it, it, it is an issue of accountability. It is an issue of sensitivity to our environmental challenges that is lacking very much on, on a global scale. It, it, you know, it's easy for liberal Western democracies to say that there is a legal institution within Western liberal democracies for, for various sorts of things, but there is a global rise of illiberalism. And even within the United States, there is a clear rise of illiberalism. So we, we would hate for the reader to interpret our, our book to mean that we're trying to shame China. That is by no means the intent. Uh, the intent really is just to, uh, like Judy said, um, point out um, areas where, where there are problematic um, trends, but also give China credit where credit is due. So we have come to the end of our time, uh, wondering if either of you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for the discussion, uh, to the audience for all of their questions. It's been a very informative conversation. A recording of this program will be available on the council website, YouTube channel, and social media platforms shortly. As a reminder, Yifei and Judith's new book, China Goes Green, Coercive Environmentalism for a Troubled Planet, is available for sale at the bookseller. Uh, link can be found on the event page and here in the chat. Uh, thank you all for joining us today, and we hope you will continue to engage with us. Thank you. <laughs>